Good afternoon. I'm glad y'all could be here today. We're back again for some more review. Uh, this week, we will look at Unit 7, free response questions, and we'll also talk about a few test taking skills. So it's two o'clock, so this is being recorded. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, please ask questions um, at the end. If I miss a question during the, um, you know, as, as we're going through all this information, I'll definitely be sure to check the chat if you want to ask a question there, or you can ask a question verbally um, as you think of it. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, let me. Okay, so unit seven, um, I like to use um, interesting little memes. So I love this one from Hunger Games, may equilibrium shift in your favor. And so that's what we'll be talking about today is equilibrium. Make sure that you, you know, have a periodic table handy, a formula sheet might be helpful if you already have the free response questions. That could be um, helpful as well. Definitely want to try these questions as we go and have a calculator as well. All right, let's jump right in to the first free response. And before we actually, <clears throat> excuse me, before we get to that, let's just look at a couple of things. Um, I did want you to um, remember that there are a couple of parts of equilibrium that are from chat, um, excuse me, unit seven. You know, the rest of the equilibrium section is about acids and bases. And so I've kind of only taken a snip of the two parts of equilibrium we'll be discussing today. And there is one part that's missing. Notice there's case C, C standing for concentration. Notice we have brackets, those are molarities. And KP, which deals with pressures of gases. Notice no brackets, those are parentheses. The only type of equilibrium, as you see, that's not listed here. I'm looking for my pen. Um, hold on just one moment. Is KSP. So um, KSP is not here but we, that's still very important and definitely could be on the exam. But, you know, since we can, we're gonna work on next week, make, you know, coming up with maybe an even more specific formula sheet, that would be a good thing I would suggest that we add to our formula sheet is KSP and really what an expression that ha includes KSP would look like. Um, if you're looking at um, the statements under this snip of the um, exam, it just says, remember, substances that are gases or aqueous solutions are included. We would not put a solid or a pure liquid into our equilibrium expressions. And then with these problems we're going to be doing, we definitely will be setting up some rice tables. So we'll be talking about keywords to look for to know, hey, I need a rice table so that I can find equilibrium concentrations. And once I have those equilibrium concentrations, I could plug those into um, my equilibrium expression. Um, another important part of equilibrium is Le Chatelier's principle. And th these two graphics just kind of give you an idea as, you know, just a summary of this. I know Mr. Elegante presented about this earlier, but just, you know, <clears throat> if there's a disturbance on a system at equilibrium, the reaction will shift to minimize that stress and go back to equilibrium. So these arrows indicate which way reactions would shift. One thing that's not included here would be our endothermic or exothermic reactions. And so when you think of a reaction as being endothermic or exothermic, it's really helpful to, um, it's really helpful to think of heat as which side of the reaction it would be on. So if it was an endothermic reaction, we would have heat as a reactant. 
So just like the first example shows adding more nitrogen gas, if we had an endothermic reaction, that would just be like adding another reactant. That's one way to think of it. So that would shift the equilibrium right as well. And then if we had an exothermic reaction, heat is a product. So we can just think about if we add a product to um, a system, like heat, then it would shift to the left, just like this says adding more ammonia. So let's go ahead and look at the first um, FRQ. And notice, notice that um, the first question really deals with a redox reaction. So let me, um, I hear some background noise. Let me see if I can minimize that. All right, good, I just didn't want that. Um, I didn't know if y'all could also hear that, but um, so we have this balanced reaction and we're, the student claims that this is a redox reaction. And the question is, is the student correct? Just justify your answer. So for a redox reaction, remember we've gone over this in um, another presentation, we are looking for a change in oxidation number. So we would have to go through and really assign oxidation numbers for each of these substances to be able to justify, and that's what I've really wanted to point out here, just saying yes or no really is not gonna get you any credit on the AP exam. You have to be able to explain why you're answering and, and giving some evidence of your answer. So if we did go through and assign oxidation numbers here, we would see that um, the student is incorrect because no, substance in this reaction changes oxidation numbers and they would be looking for not just saying that nothing changes oxidation numbers it, the best answer would include actual even if you just wrote the values above each substance that would be the best indication of saying like the hydrogen and sulfuric acid if you had a plus one written above that and then um, a positive six above the sulfur and a negative two above the oxygen even if you had that work obviously um, you know, this year, I'm thinking of in the past um, AP exams, this year you would actually have to type that in, those oxidation numbers or be writing on your paper. But you do need to have that evidence to, to either agree or disagree with the student's claim. And make sure you clearly state if you've agreed or disagreed with your evidence for your answer. Okay, let's look at two, calculate the mass in grams of NaCl needed to react with excess sulfuric acid to produce three grams of HCl. Assume that the reaction goes to completion. Okay, so here, when we're looking at this, um, it's a good idea to, you know, you know, I don't know if you would want, I don't know that you're gonna, you can't really annotate these questions, but you could definitely jot down, like what is, what is this question? Like if that helps you keep, um, you know, keep track of where you're going, like mass of NaCl, that's my question. And I need, what I'm starting with here is three grams of HCl. So if I take my three grams of HCl and I need to think, how can I get to mass of something completely different? Hopefully you're thinking of your stoichiometry. It is confirming here since it says the reaction goes to completion that, you know, whatever amount of HCl was um, used was coming from that um, limiting reactant in ACL. So if I go from three grams of HCl, I should do a um, molar mass. I hope you're thinking molar mass, divide by molar mass. Then I need a mole ratio and I will end up with moles of NaCl, which is my other reactant. Um, and then I can change that to, um, using molar mass to the grams that are asked for. Let's look at that um, solution on the next page. Notice for AI, the answer was no, the student was wrong. And notice there are, it is a good idea to show that, that work, that none of the oxidation numbers changed. And then for part double I, this is just some stoichiometry. Be prepared to do some simple math as we've been told for the new exam, but you know, you've got to decide and practice, is it going to be easier for you to type this in? I know Mr. Elegante gave an example of having boxes already, you know, typed up, but really you don't want to try math on the computer 
I don't think it's going to be extensive, but it would be helpful if you had some idea and some practice of this before you got to that point. So you need to really practice how well at the end of the presentation, you'll see the AP demo website that is already live. It said it would be up May 4th. I went to it today and it actually already worked. But um, anyway, you need to be ready and practice in advance as to how you're going to submit your answers and, and answer the questions on paper or typing. So here you see you've got your three grams divided by the molar mass of HCL. It is a two to two mole ratio, which does reduce to one to one. And even if it's one to one, you're expected to show that work. And then you have your molar mass of NACL at the end, giving my final answer of grams of NACL. Check your digits. You have three significant figures you started with, three at the end, and you're in good shape. Um, right now, I am missing my pen that I write on on this slide. So I'm going to try to quickly find that. There we go. OK, sorry about that. I will go back to where we were. I was just wanting to be able to write instead of just talk about it because we don't, that's, you know, what we do in chemistry. All right, here's the continuation of this question. Notice it totally changes to a different reaction. It gives us a new reaction. And here's where we get into equilibrium because I see a K. So methanol and HCl are combined in a 10 liter sealed reaction vessel and allowed to reach equilibrium. The initial partial pressure of methanol in a vessel is 0.250 atmosphere, atmospheres, and that of HCl is 0 0.600 atmospheres. Okay, so that's just a lot of information. So I'm just thinking, okay, I know it's going to equilibrium. I have a K, I'm thinking about this, and I have keyword initial partial pressures. Okay, initial partial pressures. So what am I going to have? I feel like I'm about to have to do a math problem, but let's read the first question. Does the total pressure in the vessel increase, decrease, or remain the same as the equilibrium is approached? Justify your answer in terms of reaction stoichiometry. When, when they give you a specific direction about justifying your answer, make sure your answer involves whatever you know, you've been instructed to include. If not, you're, you really don't have a a good chance of getting credit for your justification. So stoichiometry, that when you see that, that you should think mole ratios. That's what I think when I hear that. So notice that I'm gonna go back to my reaction at the top and I see I have a one mole, understood one, understood one. Wow, they're all ones and they're all gases. Okay, so there's nothing that really would be left out of an equilibrium expression in this reaction. So I have two moles of gases forming two moles of gases. If I have equal moles, I think about my Le Chatelier um, relationship. If pressure or volumes changed, I, it, that is dependent upon moles of gases. And I notice that these are equal moles of gases. So my answer needs to involve that. And so for this answer, you would want to say, that the pressure remains the same, okay? Because two moles of gaseous reactants, as it says, produces two moles of products. Because if the moles are the same, then the pressure would not change, okay? That one was a little tricky, but again, we haven't been asked to do a math problem. You really just have to think about it. It said stoichiometry, and we need to make sure our answer includes that reasoning with moles. With part two, considering the value of KP, calculate. Okay, here we go. This is what I was getting ready for when I was reading all that information earlier. Calculate the final partial pressure of HCl after the system reaches equilibrium. So, I'm, so really, it's asking me for the equilibrium partial pressure of HCl. And I notice, I'm going to go back and see what did I have to start with? Okay, I remembered I have my KP. I have initial, that should ring a bell, and then I'd underlined all that before. So when I see the words initial, and then I'm asked about equilibrium information, I hope you're thinking rice table. So I need a rice table here. So I've got my reaction. I'm going to just draw in my arrow. So I've got reactants and products. I have my, um, 
I went ahead and plugged in my initial concentrations. And these aren't concentrations. I, keep, I think I've said that, that they're actually pressures because we have a KP. So we need pressures in our table, not concentrations. And notice I plugged in zeros for the two products. Um, you know, if nothing's mentioned about a product, mm -hmm. then you're expected to remember that it is zero. So, so now what do I do from here? Because my question is, what's going to be in that box? Calculate the final partial pressure of HCl after the system inside the vessel reaches equilibrium. Okay, well, I have two reactant pressures. They're different values. They're in the same mole to mole ratio. So really what I need to be thinking here is which one of these do I need to use to use for my change line? So this is really has to do with like limiting reactant. If they're both one to one, it's the smaller amount, okay, that I'm going to use for that change line. So I've got my subtracting here, the other reactant, since they're um, reacting in the same mole to mole ratio, would be the same value. If I was asked about products, I would be continuing on with this same pressure all the way across. Now, why are all these change lines the same? Because all of these reactants and products are in a one to one mole ratio. So when I do my math in this table, this is how I get the answer 3.50 atmospheres. Okay. So um, my final answer, I would say, is. HCL's equilibrium partial pressure is 3.50 atmospheres. Make sure you have a unit. Again, I'm not going to finish that table. Let's look at the rubric. And yes, they have the, the same information. Um, all right, let's just keep going. Part three, the student claims that the final partial pressure of methanol at equilibrium is very small but not exactly zero. Do you agree or disagree with the student's claim? Okay, the student claimed that the final partial pressure of methanol at equilibrium is very small, but not exactly zero. I thought this was a tough question. I'm gonna go back to my, and I'm gonna go back to the one I wrote on. Okay, so I'm thinking, well, if I went ahead and subtracted down here, I would have written a zero there. And then I would have also, you know, if I wanted to really fill this all the way out, I would have had all this information. So what they're saying is, is this really zero? So let's really think about this. What kind of problem is this? Is this a completion reaction or is this an equilibrium reaction? So really, we have to answer this, even though I have a zero in that um, table, I have to answer this based on this is an equilibrium problem, okay? At equilibrium, as we see by our huge K value of 10 to the third, the products are definitely favored, at, at, you know, when we have such a K that's so much larger than one. However, I do also have to remember that this reaction, even though it's favored in the Ford reaction, has a very, even if it's very, very tiny, has a small amount of reverse reaction that's occurring. So, and again, I can imagine that this would, you know, be really tough to answer. The answer is, you should agree, okay? If it said this was a completion problem, then I would say there's no question it went to zero. But because it's equilibrium, we know that there would have to be a very small amount of both reactants, even though it's mostly favored in the Ford reaction. Okay, so here's the official rubric. We would agree, even though there's a very big K, um, this is an equilibrium situation. There would have to be some reactant molecules to exist. And, or, and maybe some of you thought about this, if you actually plugged in everything, that was given at the bottom of your table with the KP. I, I don't think I would have thought about doing this, but a lot of students who really are great math students, if you actually solve for the partial pressure of methanol, it would be extremely small, 10 to the negative fifth power for pressure. But as you can see, it would have a tiny value. So I just wanted you to see that and just to think, 
equilibrium means even if the amounts are super small, there has to be a little bit present. Okay, let's move on to number two. Again, we're gonna deal with mostly KCKP to begin with, then we'll move on to a um, KSP for the last few questions. All right, when solid ammonium chloride is heated, it decomposes as represented above. The value of KP, and I'm gonna circle that, because they just told me a K and it wasn't at the end of the reaction, which is where I really like it because it helps me highlight it. It's in the information. So I need to definitely take note of that. Okay, and, and it gives me a temperature because remember equilibrium constants are only valid at a certain, at whatever temperature is given. If the temperature changes, the K would also change. So here we go. A 10 gram sample of solid ammonium chloride is placed in a rigid, evacuated three liter container that is sealed and heated to this temperature. The system comes to equilibrium with some solid ammonium chloride remaining in the container. Write the expression for the equilibrium constant for the reaction in terms of partial pressures. Okay, so they've, you know, there's, we have KC and KP, but they've told us specifically the only way we're gonna get credit for this is if we follow their directions. So we need to write a specific KP example. So if I have KP, I need products over reactants and you must write the P referring to partial pressure and then whatever formula, so here's my, one of my products, it's like a subscript. So I'm saying the partial pressure due to ammonia times the partial pressure due to HCl. And that's all I'm gonna write. I could write over one if I wanted to, but I'm not gonna include my solid because we don't include solids in the equilibrium expressions. If you look at the way that um, key is written or the rubric, and there's the reminder of you know, why I did what I did, they did not use parentheses, okay? So parentheses, you can, I, I always use them just because that's what the formula sheet looks like. It's not required. But if you use per um, the brackets, you would not get the point. So just keep, just to make sure you realize brackets only means molarity. All right, so moving on to B, calculate the partial pressure of ammonia in atmospheres at equilibrium at 575 Kelvin. Okay, so we have, let's think about what we have. We have our equilibrium expression, okay? We know this value. We really don't have any information about these two partial pressures at equilibrium, okay? We've only given, been given a, gen, you know, a general information about a solid. We know these are forming gases. We know there's some solid left. We have no idea how much, so we can't really use that information. This is actually simpler than it appears. See, all we know is this, but we do know that these are in the same mole to mole ratio. So all we can do here is plug in X times X, okay? So if we have 0 0.0792 times two unknown gases, pressures of two no unknown gases, which are gonna be the same value since in the same mole to mole ratio. If we take the square root of that, we do have the partial pressure of ammonia. Okay, I think that was kind of a different way that this problem was presented. I, I like that and wanted to, um, show you that because it's, it, it it looks so simple, but I just wanted you to see how to set it up because I think when you're given all these values like 10 grams and three liters, you can kind of get lost in that and feel like you need to get some information from that. And we really couldn't since we had solid left and we had no idea how much of that was used. All right, going on to C, it says a small amount of ammonia is injected into the equilibrium mixture in the three liter container. Okay, so this is really, when they're adding something to equilibrium, you know it's gonna change, you know, which way the reaction's going, okay? So I is asking, as the new equilibrium is being established at the same temperature, okay, notice, and always, Make a note of temperatures because if the temperature is different, that does matter. As the new equilibrium is being established at 575, does the amount of ammonium chloride in the container increase, decrease, or remain the same? Okay, so this is where 
It doesn't say that we should think about Le Chatelier's principle, but when you're talking about adding or removing a reactant or product, that's what, and, and we have an equilibrium situation, that's what we've got to remember is Le Chatelier's principle. So I'm gonna go up here to my reaction. This is how I think about it. Okay, so what are we adding? We've added ammonia. Well, where is that? Okay, so I'm adding ammonia, which is a product. Okay, so, and it's asking me about this solid. So I'm gonna circle it. So if I add a product, what does it do to the reaction? Well, it shifts to use up that extra amount. Okay, so if the reaction is shifting left or in reverse, what's gonna to happen to ammonium chloride? Well, the amount of ammonium chloride should, what would we answer? Hopefully you would get increase. And how do I explain that in words? Well, it's, well, first of all, it's really nice when you're given an option here. It's like a multiple choice, increase, decrease, remain the same. Pick your answer, you know, talk, work, your, work your way through it. And when you justify your answer, whatever you were thinking to, to answer increase, decrease, remain the same, you've got to write that out very specifically in words. So what would I write? Well, I would say NH4Cl will increase because as the product ammonia was added, it caused the reaction to shift in reverse, to shift left, shift towards favoring the reactant. All of those words mean the same thing. So, and here's the official rubric. It, it increase upon addition of ammonia, the reaction will proceed to the left to return to equilibrium. That causes an increase, okay? So you can say shift left. Again, as long as you specifically describe the situation, your wording can be a little different because there's a lot of ways to say the same thing, but you need a very specific answer. And that's what I want to encourage you to do is be very specific. How did you know it was the increase? Talk through the whole process that you were thinking about. All right, let's go on to two. After the new equilibrium is established at 575 Kelvin, is the value of Kp greater than, less than, or equal to the value before ammonia was injected into the container? Okay, so we know we had this original situation for Kp. We've added ammonia, the reaction shifted left, went back to equilibrium, and then here's the key. It's saying there's this new equilibrium because we had a we had a change to the system. It went back to equilibrium. What do you notice about these two equilibrium um, positions? I hope you notice the temperature has not changed. That's the key to answering this question. Is the value of Kp greater than, less than, or equal to the value before ammonia was injected? Your answer should be equal to. And to justify that, all I'm going to say is, um, since the temperature did not change, the value of Kp would be the same. So that's what you have to refer to, okay? Equilibrium is not affected unless temperature changes. So you had to signif you know, state that you knew the temperature did not change, and therefore ne neither did the equilibrium position. Okay, and then the last one, Part D, when the temperature of the container is lowered, okay, so here we go, now we've changed the temperature, the number of moles of ammonia in the container decreases. Okay, so, I, and I'm just thinking as I work through this, on the basis of this observation, is the decomposition of ammonium chloride endothermic or exothermic? Okay, so the temperature dropped and the ammonia moles decrease. So I'm going to put an arrow going down. That means decrease to me. So if ammonia decreased, okay, because they dropped the temperature, which way is the reaction shifting? All right. See, if ammonia was increasing, I would say, oh, it shifted right. But that's not what's happening. The ammonia decreased. So that must have meant the reaction was going in reverse. Okay, so let's think. Endothermic means heat is a reactant. Exothermic means heat is a product. 
if the temperature is decreasing, think of it as we're taking away heat. All right, and you could actually test this out. Like I could write heat on either side. I'll, I'll just start with endothermic. If heat's a reactant, I've got to think about I'm removing, if I remove heat, would the reaction shift towards the reactants where I've written heat? And it would. So that tells us this is an exothermic reaction. Okay, if you want to test this, you could also write heat on the product side. See, if I remove heat and it's a product, the reaction would shift towards ammonia and it would make more. So since I have less ammonia um, at, after, after this change to temperature, I can tell that heat must have been a reactant and it's endothermic. Okay, so justify your answer. So I'm gonna say the reaction is endothermic due to the temperature decreasing and less, um, less ammonia was present the reaction must have shifted to the reactants or shifted left or shifted in the reverse. Okay, and I'm sorry, my little squiggle got in the way. Um, so a decrease in temperature caused the reaction to proceed in the, oops, I got that backwards. Yeah, okay. They're talking about why it's not the answer. Sorry, I, I guess I haven't read this answer. The answer is endothermic. A decrease in temperature causes a reaction in original equilibrium to proceed in the exothermic direction. Since the decrease in temperature in this case causes a reaction to proceed towards reactants, the forward reaction, their forward reaction must be endothermic. Okay, wow. I really think if you just had this last <clears throat> sentence, okay, that you would be in good shape because really you, you just have to support why your answer is correct. Okay, so that's the key here is just to support your answer and it being correct. All right, let's keep going. We're to three and I really like this question. Okay, I like this graph. We're told you're not going to be drawing graphs. You'll be interpreting them. I think this is a great example of having to interpret a graph for equilibrium. So if we read the first, you know, they love to give you a paragraph. The first sentence, a couple sentences is just describing um, SO3 as being a um, pollutant, formation of acid rain. Okay, get to the second. Of course, you need to read everything and make sure there's not something super important that you would skip, but the second part says a chemist fills a rigid vessel with SO3 gas at a certain temperature until the pressure in the container of it is 0.83 atmospheres. Okay, that's important. The SO3 gas decomposes as the partial pressures of SO3, SO2, and O2 in the container are monitored over time as shown in the graph. Okay, so we can tell they told us the specific number. It's right there. SO3 is decomposing and it's forming two products. So, you know, if you wanted to, you could go ahead and say, okay, here's my reaction. And that's what that looks like. Now, is that a balanced reaction? It actually isn't. Oops, SO2O2. So we would have to balance this reaction to get this to um, work out. So I'd have a two, I put a two here. That should do it because that gives me two sulfurs. And then I have six total oxygens and then four plus two is six. Okay, we may or may not even need that, but it kind of helps you think about what's going on. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the next slide with more information and the graph will be included. Answer the following based on the graph. Draw an X on the time axis to show where the system first reached equilibrium. Okay, so what are we looking for for equilibrium? Well, we know that um, the rates of the forward and reverse reactions are equal, but we have pressures here. So the amounts or the pressures are going to be equal. So we need to place on our graph, we would make an X somewhere close to where those, um, those curves start flattening out. Okay, so that's all you had to do there. Obviously, you would probably, if this question was on this year's exam, there would probably specific times mentioned, you know, like on, you know, graduated on the x axis, and you would have to actually name a time. Part two describe the change that was made to the system at time, T1. 
Okay, so what happened at T1? I see a lot of things changing. What's the dramatic change? Hopefully you can see that the SO2 amount greatly in one, at that one time, greatly increased. So that's, in, of course, we can, we'll know later that that change is causing other things to change. So it looks like that SO2 was injected into the system. And that's the answer. Part three, after the change was made at time T1, the partial pressure of SO3 increased while the partial pressure of O2 decreased. Explain this observation. Okay, this is where it helps to have the reaction. Okay, so basically we added this. Which way did the reaction shift? Is that equilibrium? It's going to shift left, which explains why this um, SO3 increased and why the O2 is decreasing. So that's the explanation they're looking for here. Okay, so the partial pressure of SO, you know, by increasing SO2, we're disturbing equilibrium. The reaction shifts left, increasing the reactant SO3 and decreasing the product O2. So as you can see, there's a couple ways to answer it. I tend to answer with the explanation. You can answer in terms of Q, but it's not necessary. So just talking through it is my preference, but there's more than one way to answer some of these. Okay, one more dealing with um, just KC or KP, and then we'll get into some KSP. All right. Um, the compound BRCL can be decomposed into these two products as represented by the balanced chemical equation below. And in addition to the balanced chemical equation, we have a delta H. So anytime you have a delta H, think, Am I, do I need this? What does this delta H tell me about this reaction? Notice it has a positive value. So I have, before I even read anything else, I'm thinking, okay, this is endothermic. If that matters, I thought about it. All right, so for a 0.1, mole sample of pure BRCL is placed in a previously evacuated rigid two liter container at 298 Kelvin. Eventually the system reaches equilibrium. So this is an initial amount. Calculate the pressure in the container before equilibrium is established. Okay, so I need pressure. What do I have to work with? Well, I have moles. I have liters, temperature, and the most important thing here is that you realize you have a gas. PV equals NRT is such a common calculation that's been on past exams. Since this exam is so short, I can't promise you know that it will be included, but in every other year it was. So, you know, this would be an easy calculation if you were asked to do it. So we can solve for pressure using this. I'll just set it up quickly. So I've got 0.1 moles. My, you know, it doesn't ask me for a certain pressure units. Most people would go with the 0.08206 gas constant. It didn't, you could have answered in um, millimeters of mercury, which is the same thing as TOR using the other R value. And then you've got your temperatures already in Kelvin, which is so nice. We don't even have to change it. And our volume's already in liters. Okay, so that's a pretty simple setup. We could get our pressure, do that calculation, and then um, you can see the pressure when we solve that. It's 1.22. The equilibrium expression, that's one thing. Sorry to reveal that answer right off the bat, but let's go back to E. Write the expression for the equilibrium constant KEQ. I just wanted to say something about this. If it says EQ, EQ just means equilibrium. And so we really, for something like this, we have a choice. Since all of these are gases, they're giving you some options. You could either write the bracket version, which would refer to molarities, or you could write a KP expression that dealt with pressures. You have to pick one though and correctly relate it. So if you did molarities, you know, you need brackets. 
you'd have to have, you know, they're going to be looking to make sure you included that coefficient as your exponent um, for BRCL. Or if you want to do your pressures, again, you need your P's. They use their parentheses. And again, you must have the squared. So if it's KQ, you have a choice, which is kind of nice. What, Which one do you like writing better? I would probably write this one just because a little bit less details, maybe more used to doing those. OK, so let's look at this last question. I want you to read part F. I mean, read the information. I've included it. This was there previously. Read part F and think about how you would set this up. I'm going to give you a few minutes to do it. And there's actually a couple different ways that this could happen. So go ahead and take, you know, just a minute, kind of get started. Then I'll catch up with you in just a minute. I just want you to have a chance to reason it out yourself. Okay, so we have that previous information after the system has reached equilibrium. Okay, so remember we, as we had said earlier, that we talked about these were initial pieces of information. Now we've made it to equilibrium and here's what they're telling us. 42% of the original BRCL sample has decomposed. Okay, if you'll, you know, from the previous question, we just wrote an equilibrium expression. So it's like, did you write your equilibrium expression with brackets or did you write it with pressures? Because either one was correct. And maybe the way you wrote your equilibrium expression previously might have guided you as to how you would answer this, because there's actually two ways you can make a rice table here and both ways are completely acceptable. Okay. So I hope you're thinking of rice table, all right? Rice tables, remember, can have molarities in them or they can have partial pressures. So you really have a choice here because we have our initial partial pressure. Maybe that's what you thought of since we, and we've actually already done one like that, okay? But don't we have molarity information if we wanted it to be molarity information? So I'm going to make the rice table using molarities, and then I'll also show you the um, version with the pressures. OK, so here's how I did it. OK, and again, one's not better than the other. They're both correct. OK, so if I, you were thinking molarities, because I think a lot of times our rice tables involve molarities, you would have said 0.1 moles divided by two liters gives me gives me that molarity. That's my initial concentration of BRCL. I don't know anything initially about HCL and the other gas because they had not formed um, when this was put into the container. Then I need a change line. OK, so I know that my change line is based on this percent. OK, because that's what it's telling you. Forty two percent of the original sample decomposed. So what is forty two percent of that molarity? Well, if you do that math, it's 0 0.021. So if I went through here and I did my 0 0.021, and this is really what I wanted to talk to you about, what change is going to be in these other boxes? Is it going to be the same change? And I hope you're thinking, no, it would not. It would be half of that. So if I subtract, oops, 
point, and I'm doing this in my head, point zero, what's half of 21? It would be, you know, 10 and a half. And of course you have a calculator, so that's always the best bet, right? Because I can definitely make mistakes. Oops, and I've, I just made one. You can't subtract from zero. These are added, these are products. Reactants are gonna decrease, products are gonna increase. So I would take that down, um, you know, I would keep doing my math, I'd fill these in, and then I would fill out my equilibrium expression with my molarities. So I would have this number would be the same because I'm adding it to zero. So I'd have that, these are my products. Those would be multiplied together or you could write squared, which is probably what I should have done because I'm gonna run out of room. Those are my two products, they're gonna be over my reactant let me just do my math really quickly to make sure i don't make a mistake and i'd get 0.029 remaining so 0.029 and here's where it's so easy to forget that is squared because of the coefficient so when i solve for that k I could get that answer and I want to show you the rubric because a lot of you might have thought, wow, I never even thought about molarity because if you've already calculated the initial pressure, guess what? That's another way to do it. So notice how they did this. They, this is our answer from our ideal gas law calculation. They found, and again, um, their, you know, notice their change is going to be different because it's 0.42 times, you know, they're multiplying it times the pressure and we were multiplying times molarity. Okay. So this 0.51 is 2x. So that means half of that. So they'd have 0.26 and 0.26 in their boxes. And then when they plug that in, they're going to get 0.13 is their answer. So this is in terms of pressure. Notice at the bottom it does say in terms of molar concentration would also get full credit so we did get one point for the correct stoichiometric values so you can get if you are doing this line correctly that's your that's that point and then plugging everything in which would involve you know the most common mistake to forget to do is to square that denominator um, then you would also get a second point okay so hopefully you did okay on that and then we're going to, there's one more question and then we'll go over to, um, I forgot about this question, one more and then we'll do a little KSP because those are always, um, those are usually really short questions anyway. All right, so we've got this reaction. Notice there's your delta H. Every time I see a delta H, I, this is just my habit. I always am writing. All right, that's exothermic. Do I need to know that? We'll see if it matters in a minute. A chemist wants to run the reaction and maximize the amount um, of ethanol produced. Identify two ways the chemist could change the reaction conditions other than adding or removing any chemical species to favor the formation of more product. All right, so what am I wanting it to do? I want to shift this forward. I can't add or subtract. Okay, so let's think, what could I do? Well. First of all, let's start with our exothermic relationship. If it's exothermic, I know that heat is over here. Oops. So if heat is a product, what do I need to do with the heat? Add heat or remove heat to get it to shift forward? Well, if heat is a product and it's exothermic, I'm going to have to remove heat, which means lower the temperature. So one of our answers is going to be that. And let's think, what's the other answer? Can't add or subtract anything. Well, the only other thing we've talked about that I can think of with um, Le Chatelier's principle, which is really what we're doing here, is moles. We have two moles of gases as a reactant, and we have one mole of gas as a product. So let's think if I want to shift these forward, no, it has to be all gases. If I want to shift this reaction forward, I could change the um, pressure or volume. You know, that is Boyle's law, 
right? If I, so that's what you need to be thinking of here. So if I make the reaction container bigger or smaller, which one would it be? Okay, I want the redact, I want the volume to decrease. So the volume decreases, or you could say, you know, increase the pressure, which is why the volume's decreasing, there's a lot less space, then it would shift towards fewer moles of gases, which would be forward in this case, and that would also be the other answer. Okay, now let's go to KSP. We'll do a few of these. You've got a 100 milliliter saturated solution of magnesium fluoride. You added 0.5 grams of solid magnesium fluoride to 100 milliliters of distilled water and stirred until no more solid dissolved, okay? So assume that the volume of the undissolved MGF2 is negligibly small. So we're assuming that it dissolved. The saturated solution is analyzed and it is determined that the fluoride ion in the solution is this molarity. Write the chemical equation for the dissolving of solid magnesium fluoride in water. Okay, when I did the other, um, I think it was units three and four with reactions, there was one similar to this. I wanna say it was, um, it might've been calcium hydroxide in water, but this is, this really should be simple. And this is where students really want to add water and you don't need to. All you need to do here is just break this up, okay? Now, if you really wanna add water, you could put it over the arrow because water is obviously present. Notice I didn't even put states. States are not graded. You don't need states. If you want to put them, that's fine. If you had an incorrect one, um, it's never counted against students, but that this is really the best answer. Again, I wouldn't write the water over the arrow, but you're welcome to. Part two, calculate the number of moles of MGF2 that dissolved. Okay, so let's think about this. What do we have to work with? Well, we have grams of magnesium fluoride, and then we have um, 100 milliliters of distilled water. So this is just some simple stoichiometry, or really um, molarity relationship. So you've got your, and I, I didn't really mean to, um, let's go back. I think I was about to make a mistake. Um, we had these grams of solid MGF2. We have 100 milliliters of distilled water. Okay, so stirring until no more solid dissolves. So what, the, what is this implying here? Okay, it's implying that all this solid didn't dissolve, okay? So I was about to do grams to moles and divide by liters, and that would be totally wrong. Notice that it says the saturated solution is analyzed. Here's our key right there. This is how much fluoride did dissolve, okay? We have to be really careful here. So if I have molarity, what else do I know about this situation? Well, I have this volume of the solution. So if I have molarity and I have, um, I have my volume, I have, then I can get moles of fluoride that are present. And from that I can get, so here's really the path I'm thinking. We've got molarity, okay. We need to know how many moles dissolved, right? So if I plug in my molarity value of 2.4 times 10 to the negative third, and then I can plug in now, 100 milliliters isn't gonna help me. I need to have, um, and I'm kind of running out of room, I'm gonna have my volume in liters. So if I multiply and I get moles, then I can think, well, that's going to be, X is going to be my moles of fluoride. Okay, now, is that the answer? Well, not necessarily, because you just had the relationship written where it's, a, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. There's two moles of fluoride for every moles of magnesium fluoride. So when we set that up, and let me, I don't know why that didn't erase. Um, as you notice, they did their their um, calculation here. I, I did it a slightly different way. They're just using molarity as a con conversion factor. You must have this. And that you can see that's a common mistake not to have that because 
um, that's its own point. So these two steps together give you two points. But if if you don't, if you had stopped here, you would at least get half credit. I just that's one thing I wanted to say is I wanted you to always try, even if you don't feel super comfortable, don't leave stuff blank. Try to answer everything, even if you don't do it completely right, you could still get points for that. And that's super important. Okay. And then the last thing, determine the value of the solubility, solubility product constant KSP for MGF2. All right. So first of all, let's write our KSP expression. All right. We have magnesium ion. These are our two products of the reaction we wrote first times our fluoride ion concentration squared. So what are our concentrations? Well, we know fluoride is given from the beginning 2.4 times 10 to the negative third. So we're just gonna plug that in. That value is given and we know based on our expression, we're gonna square it. So what are we plugging in for our magnesium ion concentration? Okay, what we should realize is that based on you know our previous answer, Okay, or just the mole ratio, however you're thinking of it. And we can look at this reaction. Whatever the magnesium fluoride concentration was and is the same one to one as the magnesium ion. Or if you were thinking of it as, hey, I know this, this fluoride number is double whatever magnesium ion is. So if I have half of it, you'll see why we got that answer of 1.2 times 10 to the negative. Um, well, this is of the we need the concentration. Notice this is moles. So we have to be careful here. So because we took into account the volume. So really what I would do is I would take half of this because this is the molarity that I'm going to be plugging in. So once I do this math, squaring my fluoride ion concentration given, multiplying it times my other concentration, then I will have my final answer. And that's going to be a one. Usually that's a one point question. Here, you can see that taking half here, however you did that. Um, wow, but usually this that's a lot of points for this. Um, one point is for the correct setup. One point for the correct KSP. I would, that's wonderful because I, I think you have a really good chance of getting all those points. I, I would have expected it to be two points, you know, one maybe for the, correct magnesium ion concentration and then maybe one for the answer but wow that is that's wonderful okay let's do another one very similar we've got ksp of agcl it's given i wanted us to do this one so but previously we saw for ksp here where we're given the ksp calculate the value of the silver ion concentration in saturated solution of agcl in distilled water okay so here's that question what is the silver ion concentration? Well, we know K, and this is really how I taught my students to do this. Whenever we're given a solid and a KSP, I just say, you know, even if it doesn't ask you, why don't you go ahead and write the dissolution of this, you know, really insoluble salt and in water. And then if they give you KSP, you're gonna know exactly what that expression looks like because you have, this already written out, okay? So I know KSP and make sure you plug in the KSP here and not as an ion concentration. So you have to be really careful. Sometimes that gets confused and you're supposed to solve for these ion concentrations. Well, notice these are one-to-one -one, unlike the last one. So if, I know, if I'm solving for silver, I'm really solving for chloride too because they're gonna be the same. So really it's just the square root of 1.8 times 10 to 19. So when we do that math, and again, if it's a math question um, on the AP exam, it's gonna, I think this one's pretty simple. They said they're not gonna give you really hard math questions. It might've been something like 2.0 times um, 10 to the negative 10th, because, I mean, excuse me, 4.0 times 10 to the negative 10th, because you could take the square root of that in your head if you really wanted to. So one point for having the two ions realizing that they are the same concentration and one point for actually solving for that answer.
If we go to the next question, this is where you have to be really careful. The concentration of chloride in seawater is 0.54 molar. Calculate the molar solubility of AgCl in seawater. Okay, molar solubility is molarity, okay? Uh, my students did this problem and most of them really had trouble with this, okay? Um, remember, we just had this. I'll write this correctly. Okay, so let's think about this. Calculate the molar solubility of AgCl in seawater. We still know KSP. Here's the here's kind of the disconnect. Students forget that we have this KSP. You have to plug that in. What's the um, really what's the common um, the commonality here? And it's really called a common ion between seawater and AgCl. It's just 0.54. All you had to do here, and it looks simple when you look at the answer, but when you're reading this. I mean, a lot of times the AP exam, when they've had KSP problems on there in the last few years, they've been a common ion problem. So I did want to make sure, and that's supposed to be a five, not a six. I did want to make sure that you saw this, okay? So basically, I need to solve for this silver ion concentration because that's the part, you know, if the, between the seawater and the silver chloride, that's, you know, knowing the silver ion concentration is going to also give me, because they're in a one-to-one -one ratio, the solubility of AgCl. So when I solve for this, that does give me, I just have to divide 0.54 into my KSP. And I, you see, that's the setup here. There's your answer. And then the last question, explain why AgCl is less soluble in seawater than in distilled water. So if you look at it, here's our concentration of Ag plus in seawater. Here is our concentration um, of Ag plus without the seawater. See how it changed? Wow, I mean, it's just so, such a much smaller molarity. And it's because of really what you plugged in for part I is because of chloride, okay? Chloride is your common ion. The presence of chloride in seawater shifts the reaction in reverse and causes the AgCl to be much less soluble, okay? And it mentions common ion effect. I don't think you have to say that. So you have this huge amount of chloride solute ions in solution and it does cause the solubility to be so much less because I would even bring in this, you know, Le Chatelier relationship. Okay, the last one, let me see what time it is. All right, it's about 3.02. Um, let me see if this one was any different. Notice that this gives us another KSP. I think we're just gonna kind of maybe let you look at this on your own. You've got a KSP, calculate the number of grams that is dissolved in 100 milliliters of a saturated solution um, of MgOH2 at 25 degrees Celsius. Yeah, you have to be careful on this one because notice you don't have any molarities to deal with like we were given the fluoride ion before. So what you're gonna have to do, you're gonna have to kind of take yourself down a path. You're gonna have to find you know, I would write the whole reaction. Ooh, and there's a very common way to make a mistake. It's by putting the two in the wrong place. Um, you know, I would write this out. I would be thinking, what's the relationship between these ions in solution? Well, it's a one to two mole relationship. And knowing KSP, is a way to solve for, you know, these molarities. So it's going to be, if I solve for KSP, 1.8, plugging into a KSP expression, equals, it would be X for magnesium ion times 2X squared. That would end up being 4X cubed. Divide by 4 and take the cube root. You would have the concentration of, um, the magnesium ion, and from the concentration, which is molarity, we could get 
moles, and then grams. So this was a very long question. Um, so notice they expected you to solve that like we talked about, use the volume and then the molar, molar mass that was given. You know, to me, this should be worth three points, but notice they're only giving you one point for the solubility. And, you know, if you're given a KSP, think you're gonna need to use that to get some kind of concentration from that. And then do the, uh, the rest of the math to um, get that gram number. I do think that one is a little bit longer. Okay, that one deals with sizes of ions and Coulomb's law. I would recommend you review that as, um, you know, just as great practice. Okay, test taking skills, be prepared. The exam demo I looked earlier <clears throat> appears to be live even though it was we were told it wouldn't be until May 4th. This is a way to <clears throat> see what it's gonna look like because you know, they're telling you to enter your, um, you're gonna get this e-ticket, you're gonna click on it, do this 30 minutes before the exam starts. This is a way for you to practice and see if your technology will upload your answers correctly. Make sure you try this. All right, so when you're um, you know, taking the test, of course, if you can be as calm as possible and read carefully, you saw me not read carefully and, and I definitely made a mistake but those are always gonna be good things to do. Um, write neatly if you're not typing your answers, um, the readers have to be able to read your handwriting. And I would recommend writing with a very dark pencil, if not a pen, okay? Practice uploading pictures and if you're using handwriting and see if you can actually read it well, it cannot be blurry, it has to be taken vertically as a photo. If a data table is part of the question, make sure you refer to the specific information um, that you saw in the table that's telling you the relationship, like a higher boiling point or, you know, as we saw with the lattice energies from that last slide, you know, explain this has a higher lattice energy because this ion has a greater attraction since it's smaller and a closer distance or whatever the reason is. Okay, I like this little meme. Don't bother me while I'm doing chemistry, I'm in my element. Actually, when you're taking the exam, make sure that your household <laughs> realizes that you're in the middle of doing this. I heard the suggestion that you should, if people are on your Wi-Fi, like watching movies or playing games on a gaming system, that they should not do that because it's slowing down your bandwidth. All right, calculate moles. Again, you're gonna have to do this at some point. That is always so common. You know, do you need to use um, the moles you calculate for a mole ratio to get other information like we've seen? Do you need to, you know, use it for molarity or volume? You know, there are lots of ways you could be asked to use moles. For any question that says explain or justify, they're expecting like claim evidence reasoning. Okay, here's my, Here's my answer, my claim, what evidence and how did I come to this? Um, you have to explain. What, what were you thinking? Be very specific. Um, and again, we saw several questions with this option, same as greater than or less than. Make sure you clearly choose that and then explain it fully, okay? These are problems we've seen in past years that kids think they're being specific, but if, you know, you have to, whatever you mean is what you have to write. Okay, and I love that little kid picture. Um, for exam day, and we'll, I know we'll have more Q&A sessions coming up, a couple more for the exam. Be organized, you should have everything um, ready to go. I would get it all ready the day before, have it sitting in a, on a table or whatever area, desk, where you're gonna be working. Make sure your device is charged. And if you're typing, or writing on paper, make sure that you have two sets of papers or two sets of documents that already have initials and your AP number on them. You should not use any of your precious time um, getting that kind of information ready. And there is this um, exam day worksheet. This is just it's two sided. This is what you're expected to have um, next to your device while you're testing. And this just kind of reminds you of you know, if something goes wrong, like it, it tells you if for some reason, you know, 
the power blinks and you lose your test for a second, it reminds you that you need to click your e-ticket again to get back to the exam. That's the only way. You can't hit the back arrow. That will not get you to where you need to be and or refreshing your browser, only hitting the e-ticket. All right, so that's pretty much it for um, those two things. Um, what can, let me look at our chat. Can I answer any questions? I am not, have nowhere to be. I am happy to <laughs> answer as many questions as people want to ask. I'm trying to get to my, anybody? You can unmute yourself or type it in the chat. I'm looking, let me see. 